a wonderful introduction. And uh, it is wonderful to see all you folks here. I understand like about 2,000 folks here coming to California. I feel like I can say a little welcome here. I see you now. I'm based in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and came down for this talk here. So welcome to California. It's good to have you all here. It's good to see so many people interested in technology, the new technology trends, how you fit in. But it's also really good to see folks that are actually part of the story we're going to be talking about. Folks that are really ensuring that we're getting that kind of telecom connections, those internet connections, those uh, mobile phone connections out to every corner of the country today. And so I thank you for what you guys are doing as well. Now, I also want to just mention since uh, the Secretary of Agriculture there, uh, Vilsek, mentioned his rural roots. I did want to just say that uh, I'm originally from Minnesota. And I grew up in Twin Cities, although my mother was from a small little farming town called Hugo, Minnesota, and all her side of the family still rooted up there. And so I both appreciate it as growing up the uh, joys of rural life, but also some of the hardships and difficulties as well. And so like, I'm not just your typical bi coastal city slipper, I actually do have an appreciation of what's going on in the heartland, too. Um, now, what I want to basically talk about today is part of a big I'm going to take a big picture perspective here. I'm going to pull back into almost this work level and put what's going on in the economy today, all the trauma that's going on, what's going on in the tech world today with all these big new developments, what's even going on around the world here today, but put, put what's going on in, in this larger context. And in fact, putting what you folks are doing every day in this bigger, bigger frame. Now, one of the reasons why I do that, well, one of the reasons is that too often, Folks get caught in what I would call tweet timers, it's 24 hour news cycle, cable news kind of cycle. And we're so focused on why the country's virtually one minute or the next minute or what's happening from minute to minute. Bad way to understand what's really happening. Most working people kind of get caught in this kind of frantic beat rhythm. Take a, you know, speaking for they can boot up on Monday morning and they come off the other end of the weekend and then they boot up again. So they kind of see their lives in weekly rhythms. Uh, that's another kind of too, too narrow a focus and from my point of view. But then also if you're a business, you're thinking maybe quarterly reports. Unfortunately, most businesses don't think too much longer than that. And that's, I think, a real disservice for what's going on. Occasionally we step back. The biggest we step back is kind of an election cycle, which we're in now. And we've got to think, okay, what happened in the last four years? But what I want to talk about is more what goes on in the rhythm of history at a national level and ultimately even in a world historic level. I think if you understand and look at our era, look what's happening today in that bigger frame, that bigger historical context, a lot of what happens in the ground in that kind of, those shorter cycles makes a heck of a lot more sense. And so that's what I want to do to you today. Now, if you look at it that way, I would argue, and I'm going to argue here, that we're essentially going through something that is a very relatively rare thing in America, but it's essentially a fundamental reinvention of America. And we've seen this happen several times in history, where essentially America reinvents what it is to the economy, how the economy works, how society works, how politics works. We essentially go through a rapid phase of really dramatic innovation. It happens about, it takes about 10 or 20 years. I'm going to make the argument we're in one of those now. Now, what happens in these periods, or why this happens, is essentially two fundamental things happen in the country. It also happens in other parts of the world. But let's just put it in the American context here since we're an American audience. One is you have such deep structural changes to the fabric of the economy, of the society. For example, you go from an agricultural, predominantly agricultural economy, which we did in the 19th century, to an industrial economy in the early 20th. We're talking about that kind of level of fundamental changes happening in society. Those forcing changes because the old system doesn't work anymore and you have to essentially reinvent what it is to how America really operates. The second thing that happens always historically is we come up against some kinds of huge challenges that we've never seen before. They're unprecedented, we don't know how to solve them, the old system is ill-equipped to deal with them. And so what happens is we have these explosions of innovation. Now historically, I would say we've had about four of them. One happened, this is Thomas Jefferson, the, the founder of the Democratic Party. We saw one in, in 1800, they called it at the time the Revolution of 1800, and essentially he ushered in a democratic kind of a, a democratization of the economy and society that really actually hadn't been seen for a while. And that set up essentially a system of how things worked in America for about uh, 50 years. But again, it took about 10 or 20 years, it wasn't just all about Jefferson, but essentially there was a big explosion started around that time. 
The other one, in the middle of the century, Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party, he ushered in a crazy uh, period of innovation. It's not just about the, the Civil War, although everyone had to do a lot about that, but he brought in, you know, the, the, the transcontinental railroads and the land grants, uh, universities, the democratized education, the Homestead Act to kind of open up the West. Tons of, essentially, it's reshaping what America was for the next 50 years. We saw another one at the turn of the 20th century. This is Teddy Roosevelt. He started the era, what we call the Progressive Era. And but Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, actually ended that era. So essentially, these things are not partisan. They're actually often bipartisan, these reinventions of America. And that essentially created what, what it was to be a big urban, uh, urban society, essentially industrial society. It's kind of innovation in that period. And the last time we saw it at this scale was essentially the Great Depression, World War II. What came out of that, the post-war world, essentially the invention of that society, is essentially what we're still basically working on today. But our, that system, 60 years old now, is essentially coming into fundamental difficulties now. The old system's breaking down. We're in one of those bogus doubts, what I would say. And so if you think about our era, what's going on in our era? Well, one thing is the country is going through the biggest technology transformation we have ever gone through, folks. Essentially, we are, in, in essence, we're essentially it's the computerization of everything and the interconnection of everything. Essentially, it's going all digital. And that fact, that transition, essentially will be seen in 500 years or 1,000 years, they'll look back and say, oh, early part of the 21st century, the world went digital. That's the, how fundamental that shift is going. The second thing, which is partly related to this, is essentially all systems are kind of going global, partly because of this interconnection of the, the technology. But again, folks in 500 years' time, they'll, they'll say, ah, what were the big things that happened in the early 21st century? World was global. And that would be a, a threshold essentially we're crossing that we've never had to deal with before. But we've also got our unprecedented challenges. There are many things that are kind of coming up here, not the least of which, and we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, climate change. But it's not just that global challenge, but essentially all kinds of challenges. I mean, if you look around at it, you know, there's all kinds of system breakdown. You know, our, uh, the education system's not working, the health system not working. You know, global terrorism is a new phenomenon we spent the last decade trying to figure out. We're actually doing pretty good on that progress. But all kinds of things are breaking down. How do we sustain the retirement of the baby boomers? Many, many challenges. This is a sign of what happens at the beginning of these eras. System breakdown, ushers in reinvention, we see an explosion of innovation. So whether you like it or not, we're basically in the beginning of one of these times of transition. Many, many opportunities come out of this, and many positive things, but also it's a lot of trauma. It's a lot of difficulty. A lot of things, in fact, it's interesting before us talking here. Um, there's kind of a sense of just a trauma and transition coming out of Washington as well, right now. But to make you understand basically how this meta transformation is happening, I'm going to break it down today in six quick areas, relatively quick. Remember, we're moving through a lot of uh, information here. The first thing I want to basically do is I want to basically give for folks outside of the technology world, there's, uh, um, even folks like you who are in telecom, there's some really fundamentals about the digital revolution of that you really got to stay focused on, which is because we have a lot more room to go in this, folks. In some respects, you can say we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of what's covered. The second thing is I'm going to focus on three areas that you really have to focus on for the next 10 years here. There's what's going to happen in mobile, What's happening? Video, big difference, big deal. And what's happening with essentially social media that people think we're, what's the next phase of that? We need the forward spin of all three of those areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about demographics, particularly generational change and also immigration, two big things that are going to hit our giving right now in America. We're going to shift then a little bit into how that drives economics. And I'll make a very kind of counterintuitive argument that we're in a very, very long way boom here, I would say, long term. Much as it kind of seems bizarre talking in this uh, recessionary feeling here. I am going to talk about shifts in energy because you cannot talk about the 21st century without getting, coming in terms of some of those shifts that are going to be happening in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I'll turn that wind back with a little bit of a few thoughts on what's happening in this uh, transformation. Well, there's a lot to go through. Uh, all these are connected dots between things you may be familiar with, you've heard about, but what I'm going to do is put them in, in context, connected dots. Always put it with a forward spin, five, ten years out, and also give you some insights to what's coming next. Now, that brings up 
the digital revolution. Again, I started the early Wired magazine. Was really the first magazine to explain what was probably happening in the very early 90s, early mid 90s. And one of the things that essentially is at the core of this digital revolution is a thing called Moore's Law, which is that every 18 months to two years, engineers figure out how to get twice as many integrated circuits on a chip, which essentially shrinks the size, doubles the power, and drops the price. That phenomenon has been happening over and over again every couple of years here. Now, doubling power, that's the key thing here. And just to remind folks what doubling is, and so it's kind of a simple way to think of it, is doubling when you first start out is not that remarkable. Those little things popping out are like, okay, but it starts, when it starts to get traction, that's when it starts getting interesting. So there now, hmm, that's a big jump. Ooh, that next one went boom. Oh, the next one goes boom through the ceiling. The next one goes up two floors, then it goes four floors. It's the back end of these doublings where things get really kind of crazy. That's what's been happening in technology here. So the kind of way to understand this is from the group demographics here. I think folks can remember back in 1977, uh, which I definitely remember, really the first personal computer or among the first was the Apple II. And the way you measure power in computers is a megahertz, or one way to measure it. And one megahertz would cost in today's dollars roughly $5,000. 30 years later, you can get a 2 gigahertz or 2,000 megahertz Dell for about 1,000 bucks. Well, if you do the math on that, essentially computers are 10,000 times more powerful, or you can flip it around and say they're 10,000 times cheaper. Now, if your car was doing that over 30 years, you'd be driving cars for a nickel right now, right? <laughs> this is not, this is an extraordinary dynamic that's going through computers. Now, what that means if you go back to that same period when the Apple II was happening, 1975, we took the most powerful computer in the world, supercomputers. Here's one. There's another way to measure computers is up the speed, the clock speed, they call it megaclocks. And this time, if you took the, one of the big supercomputers that time, it about, cost about 31 million bucks and had about 150 megaclocks speed, big deal at the time. Right now, every iPad 2 has that. In fact, it's more. And in fact, that chip from the iPad 2, is now in the iPhone 4S, the latest one that came out. So essentially, folks, you have a $31 million supercomputer sitting right here. And it ain't stopping. It's going to continue. It's a huge deal. Now, let's shift quickly to the internet, your telecom space, because the other side of what's going on is things are being connected, right? Well, the other law in the kind of, you might, have, you, know, you might be familiar with this, but in Silicon Valley terms, we think of it as Metcalfe's law. Essentially, the value of a telecom network essentially equals the square of the number of users. It's essentially trying to get the, that same exponential dynamic going on on the, uh, on the networking side. Now, some way to understand this, and you actually all know this, let's go back to the first phone in the town. If you had one phone in your rural town, it was useless, right? Who are you going to talk to? You need at least one person to connect to, right? Well, if somebody across town connected, that's interesting. Now, here's where the exponential thing happens. All you need is one line between those two networks, and it's not just one person you add, it's four people you add. It's boom. The power, the value of that thing is much further up just by connecting up networks. And the more you connect up other networks, boom, it starts to go into a much more kind of richer, much more complex networks. This is the network effect that they constantly, constantly talk about in Silicon Valley, and that's essentially the dynamic that's been behind this global internet phenom. Now, just to give you some statistics, people probably don't actually know as much about uh, some of these numbers. But if you take everybody in the world now, as of 2010, this is what the percentage of these regions of the world that are online. The United States, North America is about as high as they go, by 80 percent, roughly, think of it as. Again, you guys are doing good work trying to get, it, get back into that, probably get deeper into that, so we get 100 percent penetration over time. Um, Anyhow, you get, but you start to see what's going on in the Middle East, right? You're talking about, about all that stuff going on in the Middle East. Ah, it's hitting 30% of folks are getting online now, all these different regions. What's interesting is, you go back 10 years to the turn of the century, the millennium, 2000, we only had 30% of people online. So a little over 10 years ago, folks, and we were essentially the same kind of tradition as the Middle East guy. Look at how fast that's gone up. Boom, 10 years online. It's even more interesting. You 
you've now got to take the whole world. You've essentially got about a third of the world is now online. Over 2 billion people. What's even more extraordinary is 75% of the world is on cell phones. 75% of those. I would wager that most people in this room did not have a cell phone 15 years ago. Just 15 years ago. And now you've got 75% of the planet has it. Well, here's what's going to happen. You forward spin. It doesn't take much thinking, but you're going to go, hmm, that minor, that kind of initial telecom connection is going to go from roughly to everyone. Now, there will be super destitute people in some remote areas of the world that aren't going to have it. But roughly from a global point of view, you'll think, ah, everybody's not that internet. And then after that, once you get the kind of initial kind of landline, or not um, mobile line, but it's essentially the uh, voice line, right on the back of that, you'll start getting the internet connections, boom. On top of that, as we know how it works, you're going to start 4Gs and other kind of broadband that'll pop on and out. And so it's not, this is essentially the next 10 years is totally on path to have the entire world connected, essentially all over the world, with basically high bomb broadband. Now, again, you guys are in the trenches for now how difficult that you think that will be even in the United States. But on basic training terms, it's not crazy to start thinking that's happening globally in the next 10 years here. So let's shift now to the kind of areas of technology. Again, I come from the value. There's three kind of major areas that you really have to understand what's coming in the next five, ten years here. One, absolutely, I use mobile devices. And of course, to understand that, you got to understand Steve Jobs, who just died this year, as we know, it was last year. Of course, there's been all kinds of pains in him. But again, from a historical perspective, this perspective I'm kind of trying to get you at, this guy was incredibly important. He really was the visionary that essentially got us to the digital promised land at some level. Now, one thing is, he's also got, right now, Apple is the most valuable uh, uh, company in the world. In fact, in this moment, what's amazing about that is this is basically market cap of uh, Microsoft and Apple from the early days when they both were kind of neck and neck to the big boom when Microsoft, you know, was kind of trouncing Apple and Apple's the wilderness, but it's this singular vision that Bob Jobs had about this kind of intuitive devices that were super personalized and in everybody's hands. He just kept at it, he's got traction, he's passed up Microsoft, he's now passed Exxon Mobile. Apple is the most valuable company in the world. And many of these tech companies are right behind him. What he did, his last act of brilliance basically, was to figure out the last piece we needed to get go all digital, was we needed essentially a pad in which, you know, we needed the iPad basically. We needed a thing that was big enough to actually read a book, big enough to see the rich media of essentially a magazine and of newspapers, and also combine it, which you can also see videos. He did it on this thing, and it essentially exploded. You can't, you know, essentially these, the sales agents exploded. Not only that, of course, what happens is once you break the new paradigm, we've seen a ton of these, uh, in fact, up to 50 new models, essentially, the way that these things. Now again, I don't know how many of you folks have these things, but I will tell you, this, these are going to be ubiquitous in two, three, four years. And if you haven't really started wrapping that around, I would really do this. Because it is the, kind of the last piece of this digital revolution. Now, folks would say, uh, again, at Wired, I remember all these, you know, there was a time in the 90s at Wired when people said, oh, no, never do their credit card on the internet. That's no way they'll ever do that, right? And then there was a period where they're like, oh, no, I'll never read a book on these tablets. Well, look at these numbers here. Just these are 2010 numbers um, for Amazon. Essentially, to cut to the chase is Amazon sells more as many books, electronic books, not e-books, as they do all hardbacks and all paperbacks combined. These numbers are a little out of date, but it's roughly at a par right now. <coughs> People are reading these books. And in fact, the iPad, in the first nine months of the iPad, they sold 100 million books uh, on the iPad. People will read it if you give them the right interface. Now that's the consumption side. That's how people kind of consume this digital media. Now they, the other side is the production side, of how you produce this. And that's where you go back to this little mini supercomputer thing we talked about. But one thing that's amazing about it is they're now all embedded where they can shoot high definition HD video. Now anyone in the business here, and these guys are shooting here, will know literally about 10, 12 years ago, it would cost you about 10 grand, $10,000 to buy for an HD camera. I'm actually in that business and kind of understand it. The price has just come dramatically down. So now you've got these little things shooting HD video. Now it's not the highest quality, but it is HD video, which is terrific. 
You also got this ability to kind of connect from anywhere, as we all know. And the numbers are starting to get crazy. This, um, by 2010, they had 100 million of these things. Uh, basically, now the smartphones behind the iPhone, of course, there's all kinds of them. You start to really get all these in the hands of everybody. Now, the thing where it's going, which is why I'm always trying to tell you where is it going, is video. This is the big, this FaceTime is these video channels, which has a lot of implications for you guys on uh, the girl talking about. It's essentially, they're basically betting on these video channels. Oops. And so here's an example. We'll give it back to what I said earlier. Um, every single one of these devices now from Apple has that camera, that HD camera. Not all of them HD, but basically that's high quality camera baked in there. And of course, this is happening also with all the other kind of folks in the wake of this. So you essentially have this embedded infrastructure now where anybody can use it, which is always as a video camera pointing to you in every one of these phones and every one of these computers. Well, this is a big deal, folks, because video is really brings a whole new game into it. We've been basically spending the last million years working on how to perfect communicating with our face. We worked about the last five years trying to figure out how to communicate with your thumbs on a phone, right? The text message, right? The amount of subtlety, the amount of emotion, the amount of kind of complexity that you can convey through visual kind of uh, video is huge, huge, huge shift. And so those channels of communication are now going to be basically connecting everybody around the planet. Which brings us to this video future. We just left the mobile thing, we're moving quickly into video. And again, this has a huge implications for you folks. But uh, to understand this crew, you should really understand. We look at Jobs and Apple, we look at these guys, the Google guys, the founders of Google, uh, Larry and Sergey, and Google bought YouTube, and Google is really on the front edge of essentially the backbone of a lot of this video. And you really got to understand that crew right now. Now, the quick way, from a kind of Silicon Valley perspective, my perspective on what's happened with Digital media in the last 20 years, essentially to this, to this chart here. If you go from 1990 to 2000, basically that, that first 10 years, that was essentially the low bandwidth boom, the low bandwidth internet. And all media that could get on those low pipes, those kind of thin pipes, text and photo got sucked in, right? It took the next decade, the high bandwidth boom, the next decade, the one we just completed, essentially to bring in the richer media. And so what was the first one to get hit? was the next biggest files up for audio files. So we got hit the music industry, Napster and all that stuff, right? In the middle of the decade was the next biggest files for television. Uh, video files, well, they get hit. Right now we're watching Netflix and all this. We're trying to watch how the film industry is getting torn to pieces right now. Essentially, this is the 20-year transition of all digital media, right? Now what happens, the reason we need that broadband, essentially, and again, still needing it in different parts of the rural, uh, rural areas, is this is the difference in the, you know, just relatively the differences in the information that has to be conveyed in a kind of essentially moving video around compared to a text or image. 30 frames a second, huge amounts of information. Now that complexity, that subtlety, whether I'm winking, whether I'm smiling, how I'm smirking, whatever, all that stuff comes with the price. You've got to move a lot of data to do that. And that's probably why it took us about the last decade to build out through the back end. But this for you people in your industry, is a really interesting one. In fact, we spent a minute here just to deal with this. Um, this is what is traffic on the backbone of the internet from that same period of 1990 to 20, 2010, right? And essentially, it's a percentage of traffic, right? So if you look at 1990, the World Wide Web did not, it wasn't invented yet, right? Tim Berners-Lee had to invent it a little bit later. But by 2000, the web was where all the action was, right? That was the 50% of where the backbone was moving web stuff. Look at that blue line, folks. And what does that kick in about 2005? What's 2005? It's YouTube. And basically what you're watching now is by 2010, already, over half of all traffic on the internet is video. Half of all traffic. What gets even more crazy is you talk to Cisco, which creates the routers on the backbone of the internet. They're preparing for what they think by 2015 to be essentially over 90% of all traffic on the internet will be video. 90, that doesn't mean there are others will go away because we're going to have this increasing you know, bandwidth, but the bandwidth, the actual aggregate of all of it will keep 
expanding, but as a percentage, the name of the game can be moved in. And again, I don't have any protections for the rural areas, particularly if you don't have that a broadband. Um, so some of the numbers here are, again, for outsiders might be surprised by some of these numbers. YouTube did not exist until 2005, right? Um, by 2010, 2 billion videos a day were going off of this. 2 billion. Now there's only 6.5 billion people on the planet, right? Actually, now it's about 7. But uh, that's a huge number of folks. Now someone's watching more than one, that's for sure. But anyhow, <laughs> 2 billion. The New Yorker just gave out an article about three weeks ago. This is now at 3 billion a day. 3 billion. It's already gone in just the last year and some months. It's up to now 3 billion videos a day going off of YouTube. And that's just, you know, one, and it's one of the biggest, but it is just one video set. The uploading, the other side of it, is again, it's a two-way thing. Again, you start in 2005 when they basically had nothing going in. By 2010, they were getting 24 hours of video uploaded every minute. That New York Earth Club just mentioned, which you'd be good to have said, uh, it's about uh, YouTube basically. Uh, they just updated this, they say he's now up to 48 hours. It has doubled. There's now 48 hours of video that's uploaded every minute on YouTube. Now to put that in perspective, even back when it was half that, 24 hours of video, more video was uploaded every 60 days than all the video from all television stations for the last 60 years combined. That's the level of kind of shift that we're watching uh, in an incredible kind of shift right now. It's not just those videos, those are essentially broadcast videos in some respects. It's this interactive video. This is Skype. Skype, this is the two way interaction. Actually, Bill Seck was talking about how all the service people, everyone has college kids now, it's how they keep in touch with all these open video channels, particularly through Skype, although. But there's, uh, even by 2000, late 2000, mid 2009, the numbers are starting to get to be half a billion people doing this. Now that has only gone up because all the biggies, I mentioned Apple, Apple is now baked in. They now can get up to four people, group interactive video. You can see here, this is the way they do it in their FaceTime. Skype is now about to 10 people you can get on the call now. You have to pay a little premium for it, but you can get up to 10 people on these calls. And for those of you who are familiar with Google Plus, which is essentially Google's attempt at social networking, They've now got up to 10 people you can get on these videos. These are interactive group videos. This, by the way, when they introduced me to my company, Fortune, my new company that I founded with other folks, we're essentially building a platform for online learning, essentially, that's taking advantage of this interactive video. This is a very big shift. It's a huge deal. It's, again, one that is dependent on the backbone of um, broadband and one that I think pro America could benefit from tremendously. It's going to open up a ton of opportunities there. Social. So let's just wind it up here with a little bit of thoughts on social. Everyone's heard, or many people have heard about social media and Facebook and that, and that's kind of starting to settle into people's heads. I'm going to talk about where this is going, which is the collaborative tool, much deeper collaboration. Now to understand that, that, that world, you have to understand Facebook, to understand that, you can understand this guy, the founder of Facebook, Zuckerberg. He's about, you know, he's mid-20s right now. Um, but what happens with this, this is another way to understand the kind of telecom, power of telecom, is why these social networks are so explosive. Is basically when you just, one guy gets on the system and says, oh, I'm going to invite two friends, right? And those two friends say, okay, I'm going to just invite two friends. Well, how hard is it to invite two friends, right? But it's already doubled the number of people on them. And those two just do two, boom, they double the whole network. Doubling, every time you double, it's exponential. Those two just go, boom. The next line goes, boom, through the wall. The next one goes, boom out to the street. Anyhow, that kind of doubling is happening all through these social networks, right? So what's happened now is you've got, if you took the biggest countries in the world, most populous countries in the world, China and India being the biggest ones, basically Facebook is now uh, the third biggest country in the world. And there's no peasants on that. They're all college educated or, or high school educated or, you know, at least there's that we have together. But it's a huge, incredibly huge number of folks. And just again, to put numbers on this, they were adding 700,000 people a day last summer. That's as big as the LA Times circulation for the entire newspaper. And every day they're adding that. Partly because it's all global now. And so what you do is you've got these systems now where even when they have 500 users, million users, 
half of them are on every day, they're on for an hour. Um, anyhow, the numbers start to add up in terms of the amount of things that they're doing around. So these are just kind of understand. Now, where I want to go is to the next thing. So we kind of get that social networking is a big something going on in it. It's a big deal. But what I think is interesting is Google has got their own version of Facebook now called Google Plus. And it's an inside the words to go, I have this. Because Google essentially has all that fun social networking thing to share with your friends what you're doing. But it's adding this interactive video, what they call Hangouts, which essentially gets up to 10 people just spontaneously jumping on and being able to talk just like you're walking down the water cooler. Uh, and you ultimately, they also have, as you know, uh, a whole suite of what they call Google Docs, which is making things like wikis where you can work on the same document at the same time, or all these different things and different tools. So what you've now got is all three of those things combined makes for much more effective collaboration. So we are watching a step change in how sophisticated and complex collaborations are happening on the web. It's big for rural America because it means you can sit in Hugo, Minnesota, where my, my mom's family is, uh, and you can be tied into kind of a discussion going globally and you can with people in the Heart of Silver Valley. This is really taking a much more complex things that we're not going to be able to do online. This has been the thing that from the earliest days of wire we've all been, it's been the holy ground. How can you get really sophisticated folks, complex work, subtlety, the things that come from what you need to be face-to-face -face in and how do you make it virtual? We're basically all those there. And to make this point, I want to show you a thing, a little example. It's not of, of, of essentially a guy, this guy named uh, Eric Whitaker, who's a composer, and he said, you know what, I'm going to start to use this video channels of, of uh, YouTube, and I'm going to basically put out a casting call for people to audition for my course. And they got a bunch of people saying, oh, okay, I'll try this thing you. And he chose the right group, and he essentially had them all sing to his composition, and then he integrated it in. Uh, this wasn't live, although it's coming to the point where we will be able to do this live. But I just want to show you what happens when you open up these channels of video, the kind of sophisticated collaboration you get going. Born and people would die off in nice order and 
have one wise man and one woman probably at the top there. And uh, that, was it. that was until essentially the baby boom came along and essentially they're not going to go away. And I'm basically <laughs> the tail of the rear. And so there's a whole discussion about how we're going to work with the retirement system and all that that people are more familiar with. What people are not as familiar with is essentially this generation, it's roughly their children but also immigrants, which is essentially a bigger generation. 84 million of them right now, 83, 84. Um, and in 2015, when this is the projection here, they have said you will all be adults. And they'll almost fill all the 20s and 30s up until 40 here, roughly. That is the guts of America. That's people buying their cars, forming families. They're essentially doing the, the guts of the work of America. And that's essentially what we've got to wrap our heads around. So one way to understand is like there's a lot you can say about this generation, but I'll say it just several things here. I think I'm relevant to this larger historical kind of way of thinking about this, about what's quite outrageous. One is they are super empowered by these technologies. It's, it's almost trite to say that this is the kind of they were essentially born to these technologies. They don't think twice about it. They don't even, it's just like a fish and water. It's the way they do it. That's a big deal. The second thing is they are extremely well endowed in terms of their, what they were given. And as much as we bring our hands about education to that, this generation is extremely uh, well uh, they, they had opportunities, educational opportunities, they had travel opportunities that, in fact, the previous generation, even the boomers, did not have. It's, in historical terms, it's an extremely uh, fortunate generation, despite all our hand wringing. Um, it's the most global generation by far. I mean, most colleges now, you can get a moment, like half the kids in a lot of colleges now go abroad for at least the summer, if not a semester, if not a year. These are extremely well traveled compared to previous generations. They're extremely civic minded. They actually are engaged in politics. They like politics. They volunteer civically at rates we have not seen before. I mean, the, the hottest thing for Ivy League students to do right now is to join Teach for America. They want to teach in New Orleans. They don't want to go to Wall Street and be financial analysts and you know, make a ton of money. They actually, they want to basically help change this country. It's an incredible kind of shift in mindset what's happening with this generation. And they are the most diverse generation in American history. 40% come from minority races. Uh, and partly because of that, they do not see the difference in, in races anywhere near the previous generation. And you know, there's a lot of things to say about this generation, uh, but given the time here, we can't really do it. I will say this, though. In historical terms, many people who know about generational change are saying they exhibit many of the same characteristics that what we now call the greatest generation, which is the GI generation, the generation that basically won World War II, and essentially built the post-war world, and essentially broke on others have now called the greatest generation, they're dying off now. Many characteristics the same. They're really into teamwork, they're really into um, uh, a bunch of characteristics about them, as well as uh, their kind of civic-mindedness and their uh, propensity to essentially be the kind of people that would rebuild the society. Very fortuitous for us. Now, the flip side I want to do here is I mentioned this, this uh, diversity issue of that generation. I think without, I want to at least say, again, we're trying to do a, you know, big arch, historical arch on what are the big things happening in America here. What you have to basically take note of, essentially, is, is what's happened with the diversification of, of the population. This is essentially the American population up to 2050, uh, starting in 1980 to 2050, and essentially the whole country is going to grow at some blue, but the one that's interesting there is up to basically 30% of them, all Americans in 2050, will be of Hispanic origin. Basically. And this is not based on illegal immigration. This is essentially just based on the growth of the census numbers that we actually understand right now. Um, now, what's interesting is there's a lot of trauma and a lot of kind of struggle around with how what this means in, for America. I would argue that if you shifted this entire thing back exactly 100 years, that whole the chart. So you started in 1880 and you went to 1950. You had a very similar thing that happened. We had all this immigration of Irish, Italian, Jewish immigrants from Europe in that 1880s to basically the early part of the 20th century, and they were fiercely resistant. I mean, anyone who's seen Streets of New York, in, uh, DiCaprio's movie is a good example of the race riots and you know going after the Irish and everything else in New York. Um, anyhow, there's a ton of trauma around this. But by the end of 1950, by 1950, one guy, you know, an Irish guy was the president of the United States. The Italian guy, Sinatra, was the heartthrob of America, and Jack Benny, among others, was, you know, the Jewish comedian that basically was taking the making the whole country last. That kind of 
integration in American society. I'm convinced that what we're going through now. We have to kind of understand that kind of process of what's happening in these coming decades. Now, it's not just Hispanic. Uh, this is essentially, there's different races also, for particularly Asian races coming. So essentially, this is in 1960, actually in 64, we made a very conscious decision in this country not to bias immigration from Europe, which we've done from the previous century, or actually from the previous, all the way back. In 64, we opened up to the world. And essentially, this has been the growth of the minority population, different races, uh, until 2010. Because it's a percentage of the population, the white population has come down. And so essentially, that's the America that elected Barack Obama. Now, if you basically follow that out, and these are Census Bureau numbers, you essentially get a century point where we make it basically 2050, people are debating 2045, whatever it is there, but it's basically coming to that situation. Now, that point right there is California today. So if you go out and walk around down here in San Diego, that's California. Whites are essentially not a majority. And we're watching that really interesting mix of Hispanic and Asian, actually, uh, throughout the state here. So it's a kind of, it's not that different, really, in many respects, although it is different in some ways. Now, oops, this is already, not 2050, this is essentially already the percentages of Hispanics coming in. Uh, this is, again, not illegal. This is legal immigration. All these border states now are over a third, including California here, as I mentioned. It's also going into the heartland. You're rural America. This is a big part of what's going to happen, and inevitably, folks, this is going to keep moving all through. The biggest, some of the, I think Georgia and South Carolina are the, the biggest, the fastest growing uh, rates of um, uh, Hispanic population growth right now is, is in Georgia and South Carolina. I mean, this is happening in many different parts of the country. So again, something big demographically to wrap your heads around. Now, the one thing I want to also mention is this generational change is not just America. In fact, if you take the American population, everyone under age 30, this is not just the millennials, the millennials end at kind of 15. There's another generation behind that, it's just forming, we don't really understand it enough to name it yet. There's now 41% of young people in this, in this country. But wow, Tunisia, they just had that revolution about a year ago, right? Wow, they got 51% of people under, under um, age 30. But Lebanon, Kuwait, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Libya, a lot of problems in Libya, right? Boom, 61% under 30. Egypt, a lot of problems, you know that, huh? Interesting. Syria, right now, they're fighting it out now, right? 66%. Iraq, Yemen's also in the throes of this, 60, 75%. This, one thing you have to understand that really is this, and, this, and at 30%, they now all got the tools. This explains the movies. Young people do not give a rip for the way they've been done before. They are not beholden to the old way. They're all about the future. And those societies are just erupting now into change. And it's inevitable. It's happening all over. Syria's doing its best to hold it off. Totally losing cause. It's also going to hit uh, Iran, I would predict, very quickly here now, too. So let's shift quickly. We don't have a ton of time, but I do want to talk a little bit about economics. Because that is something that people are really worried about, obviously. And the thing about from a historical way to think about economics is don't get trapped in the recession. Don't think small. Think big. This, for example, is the growth of GDP in the United States from the crash of 29 to today. And at the top there, we've hit it, gotten a hit, basically, in this big recession, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, basically. But what's interesting is every one of these areas, these are essentially Recession, these are the recessions, and the width of them is how long they lasted. But even in the 50s, the golden age got all great, everything was great in the 50s. We were hammered by recessions, folks. 70s, early 80s, that's the rate of recession, that long recession there, boom. These essentially are IRS recessions, including right now. Recessions do not necessarily alter the fundamentals of what's going on in the economy. What does drive our economy are much more fundamental things. And I would argue the two things that are most characteristic of what drives the economy is new technologies and essentially integration together, kind of how integrated is the market, the market barriers are. And one way to understand that is to apply that analysis to what happened in the great post-war boom and to make a comparison to today. So if you went back to the 40-year period that started in the 40s, World War II ended. 
And what happened? We have all these technologies to develop the war. Mainframe computers, atomic energy, commercial aviation, plastics, all moved into the product center. One. And the second thing is we had half the world, the free world, integrating our economies in a way we hadn't done before the war. So what happens? The U.S. jumps on We've always jumped on new technology. We're the most open economy. We take advantage of it. Boom, we're booming in the 50s, right? By the 60s, Japan, Germany, the whole West is booming. And it was only in the 70s when the lifeblood of that industrial economy, oil, went through the roof and basically choked off the deck road. But we had about a really crazy growth of about 25, 30 years of really phenomenal growth. Same thing happened to our era, folks. It's hard to think of this way, but it, it's really helpful from a historical point of view. This is what happened. Cold War ends, right? Two things happened. All these technologies developed in the Cold War, computer chips were devised for guided missiles. The internet was a way to communicate with the war. Spy satellites, and all this GPS stuff, all the spy satellites. It all moves into the private sector, the public sector. You know, everyone can use it, right? That one. Two, is we integrate not half the world, but the entire world. The whole world on the same global economy. That's what happened in the 90s. The U.S., most open economy, we jump on the tech, we got Silicon Valley, we're booming, just crazy booming. But this last decade, where from an American point of view, we think, ah, it wasn't the greatest decade. From a global point of view, it was gangbusters, folks. China, India, Russia, Brazil, right now Brazil's still on fire, Turkey's on fire. I mean, all these, all these, com these countries that were coming out of communism or socialism are just on fire. And ultimately, we get to go now the same transition. The question is, how we make the transition? So this is the way to think. Don't think just U.S. Think global GDP. Crazy growth from World War II, basically. Now we're at about a sixty-five trillion dollar economy. By the way, the United States share of the world economy is always maintained about twenty-five percent from World War II till today. We wring our hands about how, oh well, my God, what's going on in America? We still have the same percent of the global GDP that we've had for the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, and what is happening? What's happening is a lot of what are these elite, kind of the front edge American uh, industries, Silicon Valley being one of them, Wall Street, Hollywood, American military, higher ed is still, everyone's coming here from all over the world, healthcare, people still coming here for healthcare. Anything innovative in the United States is doing extremely this economy. And one of the reasons is because it's sitting there at the top of an outline global economy. So what's happening here is just look at this, folks. You take the entire U.S. population there, we're a little over 300 million now, that blue one, YouTube, gets 800 million unique visitors, meaning different people every month, 800 million come every month. Well, that's more than you know, three, almost three times the U.S. population. The next one there I just mentioned, Facebook, their latest numbers. Google gets a billion hits from unique people from all over the world every month. These are global businesses. That's why they're doing extraordinarily well. And that's why, by the way, you got to have a lot of wealth for American economy. Now, this does have some implications on the wealth because we have this elite now on a global economy that is thinking same amounts of money. And essentially what's happened now is you've essentially got a situation now where, like in the 20s, you've essentially got uh, the very top part of the economy doing extremely well. And essentially what you get in the middle here, when essentially the, the wealth is being treated differently uh, in the great post-war GI generation period, essentially you had a more, uh, you didn't have the same kind of extremes. And so this again is having to do with policy, this is one of the big debates that's going on. I'm the presidential campaign. This is essentially how do you deal with this now super empowered global kind of um, sector of the economy. I'm going to mention a couple things here about China, because Americans, I think, have a distorted, I would feel, um, view about China. Uh, I was a foreign correspondent in Asia for Newsweek. They mentioned that on my, my, uh, my little um, intro here. I was there in the late 80s, and in the, in the school, oh, sorry. Uh, we have it up next year? Oh, I just thought, yeah, I just wanted to put, I was almost getting, I was doing my, the wrong story here. Let me give you this. Here, here's, before we get to this, we should do this. It's like China. When people look at the numbers here, this is essentially growth of GDP from 2000 to 2050. U.S. is going to be in the game, folks.
folks. We're, we're, we're players all the way through. That's China. These are projections from Goldman Sachs, by the way. That's India. China, by the way, will surpass our economy in about 2040. They're debating whether you know, they're adjusting that one or the other, but roughly these are huge people. They got a billion people. They're ultimately going to have more uh, GDP with time. That, by the way, was Japan, and that one is Germany. So if you look at 2050, what the global economy, the leaders of the global economy, that's it. And what's interesting is Germany and Japan, the two powerhouses of the 20th century, are essentially are almost irrelevant by the middle of the century. Um, that's why people are wrapping around. So anyhow, this is 33 people on your own. Okay, what does this mean? Now this is, we're talking about a little poor correspondent here. I was a kind of poor correspondent in Asia when Japan was on the rise in the 80s. And um, everyone's talking about, oh my god, the United States is, is, you know, we're screwed up, our whole economy doesn't work, and we're all going to work for the Japanese. This is literally, if you go back, it's hard to remember this. This was a story in the late 80s on all the kind of companies and magazines and everything. What happened? Well, we know. America essentially was just beginning to lay the ground for an incredible rebuild with the whole technology shift, the whole beginning of the web, the whole thing about computerization, and Japan was going into a long, drawn out thing with your base, it's still stuck in, driven by all kinds of long term problems, which we don't get into right now. I would argue, it's not cause for sure, but you should really think similarly about what happened this last past decade, where everybody talked about China, we couldn't do anything wrong. Oh my God, the United States are having such a struggle. I am saying, in this next 10 years, I am really strongly convinced we're just going to start to watch a rebuild of America, which will be a very, very kind of different kind of economy, the one of the extremely innovative and uh, biggest. And China, meanwhile, has extraordinary problems, folks. And I'll just leave with a couple of these, just so you don't get too wor worried about, uh, about what happened now. They have done a Extraordinary job bringing down uh, poor people. Basically, 1980, 80% of the country was living on about 25 a day. The thing is, still now, basically 18% of that country, rural folks, are still in that category. Basically, there's 234 million people. That's the size of Indonesia is in China right now living on that much a day. There is nobody in America living on that much a day, right? They have got pollution that you will not cannot believe. Basically, all the urbanization they've got going, every single one of their cities has air that is essentially con considered unsafe to breathe in America or in Europe. And these are just, this is one good example of one of their streets there. They know this, folks. They know they have extraordinary challenges. But the one that they really have, which they have to figure out, is inevitably, in every situation where you watch a country get a middle class empowered through prosperity, they always ask and need political, some kind of political power, which is essentially democratization. You have to open up democracy. These guys are still in this bizarre communist kind of kabuki dance. Uh, they are going to go through what is inevitably going to be about a 10-year process. It is going to be very painful, very difficult, and extremely messy. I would much rather have our hand dealt in the state than their hand dealt. Anyhow, I'm going to ask one last thing before I wrap. Because I think it's not, if you're thinking in the 21st century, you have to think that one of the trends you have to face your head around is essentially the shift in energies. And I know this can be contentious in different kind of, there's a partisan kind of way this gets played up in recent de decades here, but, um, or recent years here, but some of the things, I just want to throw a few stats out here. There is clearly the CO2, this is charts of essentially ice core charts for a thousand years. Uh, and about CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see about the time of the Industrial Revolution, the yellow one is essentially where it started going up, and this is essentially where we are now. It is clearly CO2 is going through the roof. Clearly, these are charts of temperature rising around the world for the last 25 years to the end of the 20th century. Um, anyhow, there's a lot of them. Now, I don't want to go into a bit on this, but there's a lot of data that something's happening to the planet. And even if you don't want to buy that thing, that reasoning for shifting, there's essentially the end of oil kind of scenario, which even oil companies realize there's only so much oil in the ground, and it probably lasts about 30 years before we're taking it out. Um, and this is the price of oil over the last few decades, and there's a lot of discussion of the scenarios of how fast the price of oil will go up. Um, 
So whether it's for economic reasons like the cost of oil is going up, or it's climate reasons, whatever motivates you, one way or the other, we're going to watch in the next 10, 30, 40, 50 years a very significant shift in our energy sources. It's going to impact everybody, including rural communities. This is a good example of essentially how our energy is produced right now. The percentage of coal up there is a big chunk, oil is a big chunk, plants. We still burn a lot of plants all over the, all over the world, right? Uh, that's what we're doing. Somehow, this is what we're spending it on, essentially. Electricity, roads, heat, cooking, a bunch of things that we have to still do, the energy use. In fact, energy use has been going up all over the world. This is essentially from the 70s. Every country's doing more energy. The red one is China. The orange one is India. We're the big black one on the bottom. We still actually have a huge amount of energy compared to the rest of the world we use. This is where we're getting our energy from, from 1900, essentially the 20th century till now. All those blues are essentially carbon energy. That middle one there, purple one, is, um, is petroleum, gas. That bottom one is coal. So we're more energy, still really on, on carbon based ones. The discussion now is by mid century, somehow, we have got to figure out a way to shift to non carbon energy sources. This is a big discussion for most reasons I mentioned there. Ultimately, we have to get about 11 terawatts, which is the highest unit of uh, energy in that direction. So something like this, with nuclear energy, there's a big discussion now about expanding nuclear energy, which doesn't give up the energy uh, but also these other ways, which a lot of these actually have rural implications. Wind, I mean, it's huge still. People are thinking, when is going to be happy to do it? Solar, solar voltaics out in the middle of nowhere is where, you know, ran into the cities. They got lots of things that I think could be seen from your point of view as opportunities. That got the opportunity to that. But let's stop for a second there. It took the 21st century challenges. I just gave my little screen face there. And remind yourself, it's not just climate change. It's all these issues, right? So I want to wrap the talk up by just going back into that space of like, how in the heck are we going to basically make these transitions? How are we going to make this transformation? How are we going to solve those problems? Well, if you go back to what happened in all these previous periods, essentially, it's very strong. Because again, there are many lessons of the past that we've had to use in the future. Uh, and so if you take the last time I mentioned on that chart in the four times in our history. The last time we went through this at this scale was this period. A lot of you folks here have some recollection or family members who were, you know, coming out of World War II and the Depression, right? Um, it's really interesting to think about what they did. Now, they had their set of incredible challenges. I mean, they had their financial collapse. Worse than ours, but ours was pretty damn close. They had their great depression. We got this kind of never-ending recession feeling. They had their challenges, Hitler, fascism. They had communism, fight. they had nuclear war on the horizon, folks. That was, that was their climate change. That was their kind of, how are we ever going to solve that problem? They were convinced, a lot of people were convinced we were never going to make it through the 20th century, right? But what they did is they could only do two things in a historical era. You take your best technology and your best brain power, your human resources, and they did that here. Here is a uh, that guy in the middle there is FDR's chief science advisor, Vannevar Bush, the guy who was credited with envisioning the World Wide Web for the first time in the distant future. So anyhow, you had a bunch of guys here and a bunch of chalk in a room. They probably have locked them up. And essentially they came up with, for their era, an explosion within about 15 years. An incredible explosion that essentially reinvented what America was. And looking back on it, they essentially figured out a new economics for that period, which was taking a new thing called Keynesian economics, uh, to kind of regen, re pull America out of that was, uh, their depression. They basically figured out a way to defeat fascism, which was not preordained, folks, in the beginning of it wasn't clear we were going to do that. Contain communism, still in a nuclear war. It's insane. We have not, six years later, not one bomb has come since Hiroshima. That is extraordinarily successful. Uh, situation we did. But it wasn't just that. They essentially, in the space of three years, built the United Nations, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. They basically just said, hey, we got to reorganize things differently. Boom, explosion. And they came back and did things like the GI Bill and, and housing mortgages and Social Security for old people. Anyhow, 
All this happened, what are you talking about? Explosion innovation, except from this is the system we're still working on. This is the system we're trying to figure out. Oh my god, how did Social Security have performed six years ago and worked in the 21st century? We look back now, we think of them extraordinary. At the time, they were just like us. So our moment in history is right now. And it's emergent, it's messy, it's not clear what's going on here. Um, all kinds of different faces in this. But this is exactly what happens with every one of these historical eras. There's always extreme confusion, there's always political polarization, there's always paralysis in our politics. And it's only when you reconstitute a new majority behind a different kind of vision that the thing really breaks up. And we have our extraordinary folks. I mean, I just mentioned four here. I mean, you know, Zuckerberg's 26, he's got about 50 years of work ahead of him. Um, these folks are every bit as extraordinary as, as a lot of the innovators of the past. It's not just the extraordinary folks. In World War II, less than 5% of the country went to college. Now it's about 30%. In real terms, we've essentially got 86 million, they, they basically, not even 6 million folks with college educations. Ultimately, we've got about 15 times that. Now, again, not only college educated folks um, are, uh, you know, valuable in the reinvention phase, but basically it's not a bad way to think like, wow, we've got a lot of common capacity here. But the thing that's the most amazing is if, could you imagine if you walked in to FDI and he said, and said hey, Mr. President, I got a thing here that you can ask any question in the world, and they'll give you back all the world's information in a second. He would look at you and say, You're insane. Or he'd say, That's magic. It's basically magic. But of course, it's not magic. It's Google. And every five year old in the country knows how to do this. So we have essentially got a situation where we've got these incredibly powerful tools. So, as I mentioned to you, just to remember, we are going to have the next 10 years. Basically, I know, but actually, your work as well as what's going on all over the world, some a full broad, broadband wireless capability. We are going to be holding those supercomputers that are only getting cheaper and better, even in the next 10 years. We are going to have these open ability for open channel video between all these people, and we are ultimately going to have collaboration like we have never really seen before. This is a recipe. This is the groundwork for a transformation. And so we are every bit is capable of making that transition to that all digital world, to that fully global world that I'm going to talk about here, to essentially a world that works on somehow solving a lot of these big challenges like climate change. And ultimately, people of the future will look back at 500, 1,000 years time and they will say, ah, early 21st century, that's when the world went digital, that's when the world went global, that's when America reinvented itself one more time. <coughs> And basically help lead the world. And with that, I want to say good luck to all of you today, and thank you very much for being a fantastic audience, and I wish you well in the next few days of your conference.